It's not uncommon to hear references to extraterrestrials when one encounters an elongated skull, but in fact, this is a quintessentially human practice that we have evidence of throughout our history. In a quiet German cemetery from the 6th century, archaeologists unearthed something that defied explanation. A skull stretched into a bizarre, alien-like shape. For years, it was a local curiosity, a relic from a forgotten time. But when scientists finally sequenced the DNA locked inside its ancient bones, they uncovered a story that would rewrite European history. The genetic code revealed this person wasn't from Bavaria or even from anywhere nearby. They were a ghost from a distant land, a key to a secret network of power and migration that shaped the continent in ways we are only now beginning to understand. Bavaria's Bizarre Burials You see, in the fields of southern Germany, history is buried just a few feet beneath the surface. For centuries, farmers in Bavaria have been plowing their fields, occasionally turning up old pottery or a rusted piece of metal. But sometimes they find something much more personal, the final resting places of the people who lived there long ago. In places like Altenerding and Straubing, archaeologists have uncovered entire cemeteries from the early Middle Ages, dating back to the 5th and 6th centuries. These were the generations that lived in the chaotic aftermath of the mighty Roman Empire's collapse. But among the typical graves of these early Bavarian tribes, something was very, very different. Archaeologists began noticing skulls that didn't look quite human. They were unnaturally long, stretched backwards into an almost conical shape. Locals nicknamed them Tower Heads, and for a long time, the theories were, to put it mildly, pretty wild. Many people were crazy about the idea of ancient aliens, while others thought they were a separate, lost species of human. What many overlooked is that this wasn't a genetic mutation. It was a deliberate, man-made alteration. The practice is known as artificial cranial deformation, and it's a delicate and frankly terrifying process. Shortly after a child was born, their head would be tightly bound with boards and cloth. Because an infant's skull is incredibly soft and malleable, this constant pressure would slowly reshape the growing bone. Over several years, the skull would grow upwards and backwards instead of outwards, creating the distinctive elongated look. The thing nobody tells you is that this process, if done correctly, had no negative impact on the brain's development or intelligence. X-rays of these Bavarian skulls show perfectly healed sutures, proof that these individuals survived the procedure and lived for decades, typically reaching between 20 and 40 years of age. But this just deepened the mystery. Why would anyone do this? And more importantly, who were these people? The practice wasn't native to Germany. It was a cultural marker of nomadic groups from the East, most famously the Huns, the fierce warriors who swept into Europe under Attila in the 5th century. When these skulls were found in Bavarian cemeteries, surrounded by the graves of local people with normal shaped heads, it raised an explosive question. Were the Huns secretly living among the German tribes? The burials themselves offered clues. These tower-headed individuals were almost exclusively women, and they were often buried with high-status grave goods, gleaming gold brooches, intricate glass beads, and fine imported pottery. They were clearly important people, not outcasts, yet they were physically, visibly different from everyone around them. It was a puzzle that sat unsolved for decades, a silent testament to a forgotten cultural clash buried in the German soil. It was a story waiting for the right key to unlock it, and that key would come from the smallest, most powerful clue of all, a few molecules of ancient DNA. But the scientists had no idea what they were about to find, unlocking the genetic secret. The breakthrough came from a team led by geneticist Krishna Virama in 2018. They got permission to analyze 41 skeletons from five different early medieval cemeteries across Bavaria. Their goal was to use cutting-edge genetic sequencing to build a clearer picture of who these people were. The process itself sounds like science fiction. In a hyper-clean laboratory, they drilled into the densest part of the skull, the petrous bone located near the inner ear, which is known to be the best place for preserving ancient DNA. From the tiny amount of bone powder they collected, they began the painstaking process of extracting and sequencing the entire genome of each individual. It's like reassembling a book that's been shredded into millions of pieces, but the book is three billion letters long. 
When the results for the tower-headed women started coming in, the team was stunned. The story their DNA told was not what anyone expected. First, they confirmed what the graves suggested. All the individuals with elongated skulls were female. The men buried alongside them were genetically what you'd expect. Their DNA profiles were consistent with modern-day Central and Northern Europeans. But the women were a different story entirely. Their genetic signatures were not local. A powerful technique called principal component analysis, which maps out genetic relationships, placed these women hundreds, even thousands of a miles away. Their DNA most closely resembled that of people from modern-day Romania and Bulgaria in Eastern Europe. Some even had significant amounts of East Asian ancestry, up to 20%, a clear genetic echo of the nomadic peoples from the vast Eurasian steppe. One woman's genome was a near-perfect match for Iron Age Scythians, ancient horsemen of the steppes. The thing is, this wasn't just a vague connection. The DNA was so well-preserved that the scientists could trace specific lineages. The men in the cemeteries had Y haplogroups common in Central Europe, but the tower-headed women had mitochondrial DNA, the genetic information passed down from mother to child, that originated on the steppes. The science was pointing to one undeniable conclusion. These women were first or second generation immigrants. They had been born and raised far, far away, but the DNA was only the beginning. The team then turned to another incredible scientific tool, stable isotope analysis. You are what you eat and the chemical signatures of your food become locked in your bones and teeth. By analyzing isotopes of carbon and nitrogen, scientists can reconstruct a person's diet. The local Bavarian men and women had a diet rich in C3 plants, like wheat and barley, which are common in the cool, wet climate of Germany. But the tower-headed women had a completely different chemical signature. Their bones showed they ate a diet heavy in C4 plants, specifically millet. Millet was the staple crop of the dry, grassy plains of the Ponic Caspian Steppe, a region stretching from modern Ukraine to Kazakhstan. There was no doubt left. These women had spent their childhoods eating the food of the steppes before traveling west to Bavaria, where they were buried alongside local men. The science had spoken, but it raised an even bigger question. Why were these foreign women there? The answer would expose a hidden world of medieval diplomacy, from the Black Sea to the Danube. To understand why these elite foreign women were in Bavaria, we have to look at the world they lived in. The 6th century was a time of incredible upheaval. The Western Roman Empire, which had controlled Europe for centuries, had crumbled. Its borders had dissolved and a power vacuum emerged. Various groups, Franks, Alemanni, Goths, were all fighting for land and influence. It was a dangerous and unstable world. What many overlooked is that in this chaos, a new form of power was emerging, one not based on legions and stone walls, but on personal bonds and strategic alliances. And the most powerful way to seal an alliance between two powerful families or tribes was through marriage. This is where the tower-headed women come in. The genetic and isotopic evidence points to a widespread system of what historians call elite female exogamy, a fancy term for powerful leaders marrying off their daughters to rulers of other groups to create political and military bonds. These women were not captives or slaves. They were high-status diplomatic assets. They were princesses, in a sense, sent from their homes in the east to marry Bavarian chieftains. The elongated skull was a visual signal of their status. It was a proud cultural marker that announced to everyone who saw them that they were from a powerful nomadic lineage, likely connected to the fearsome Huns or the Avars who followed them. It was a sign of prestige, a symbol of an international connection that a local Bavarian leader could use to enhance his own power and scare off his rivals. Imagine the scene. A young woman, perhaps only 15 or 16 years old, traveling over a thousand miles from her home near the Black Sea. Her journey would have taken her up the Danube River, one of the great trade and travel arteries of ancient Europe. She would have left behind the wide open grasslands she knew for the dense forests and rolling hills of Germany. She brought with her a dowry of gold and beads, but her real value was the alliance she represented. Her presence in a Bavarian court was a living treaty. It meant her powerful family in the East would back up her new husband in any conflict. This was the secret network the DNA revealed. 
Not a single shadowy organization, but a widespread web of kinship connecting disparate cultures across the continent. These marriages were the glue holding this volatile world together. We even have hints of this in historical text. Byzantine chroniclers wrote about Avar princesses being wed to Bavarian dukes, and the historian Procopius described intermarriages between Goths and Huns. The science backs this up perfectly. The evidence of female biased migration is overwhelming. While the DNA of the men in the cemetery shows 90% local continuity, the female DNA shows a 20% influx of foreign genes. This wasn't a military conquest where foreign men came in and took over. This was a calculated, peaceful exchange of people to forge power. These women were the key to survival and prosperity in a world that had fallen apart. They were the architects of a new Europe, building kingdoms not with swords, but with marriage vows. But what happened to their strange and painful tradition? What this discovery changes forever, the discovery of the Bavarian brides completely changes our picture of the early Middle Ages. The thing is, many people still call this period the Dark Ages, imagining it as a time of ignorance and isolation after the light of Rome went out. But these women proved that it was anything but. This was a time of long-distance travel, complex international diplomacy, and incredible cultural exchange. The people we often dismiss as barbarians were engaged in sophisticated political strategies that spanned a continent. This wasn't chaos. It was a new world order being born. These women weren't just passive objects in a political game either. The artifacts they were buried with, like spindle whorls and weaving tools, suggest they brought their own skills and crafts with them, blending nomadic traditions with local Frankish and Bavarian styles. Recent studies of the tartar on their teeth have even found the remains of plants native to the steppe, hinting that they brought their own recipes and folk medicine with them. So why did the practice of cranial deformation suddenly vanish? For centuries, it had been a mark of power, beauty, and identity across parts of Europe and Central Asia. Yet by the end of the sixth century, it had almost completely disappeared from the continent. The leading explanation points to the unstoppable rise of Christianity. As the new religion spread across Europe, it brought not only new beliefs, but also a new set of cultural rules. What once symbolized nobility or divine beauty was suddenly rebranded as pagan mutilation. Under the influence of the church, local rulers began issuing laws banning the practice outright. The Merovingian kings, in particular, took a hard stance, ordering their people to abandon any behavior that seemed heathen. And so, slowly but surely, the tradition of shaping skulls into elegant, elongated forms was buried, both literally and culturally. Within a few generations, it became something whispered about, practiced in secret, and eventually forgotten. Only the skulls themselves, eerily smooth and otherworldly, remain to tell the story. But here's where the mystery deepens, because the practice didn't disappear everywhere at once. Archaeologists have uncovered signs that some remote regions continued it long after it was banned, almost like an act of quiet resistance. It's as if these people were preserving a secret code, something passed down from ancestors whose origins stretched far beyond Europe. Some researchers now believe that cranial deformation wasn't just a fashion statement or tribal mark, it might have been part of a vast network of cultural exchange connecting distant societies from the steppes of Central Asia to the heart of Europe. And that raises wild questions. How did the idea spread so far and why did so many unconnected peoples do it in such similar ways? One theory suggests that it was a shared mark of elite status among ancient globalized tribes proof that you were part of an exclusive class that transcended borders. Another, far stranger theory argues that elongated skulls weren't a style copied by humans at all, but a way of imitating something or someone they had actually seen. That's where things get really strange. Some fringe historians and alternative researchers point to legends from ancient Sumeria, Egypt, and even pre-Columbian America where gods or sky beings were described with long sloping heads. Could it be that early humans were trying to look like these mysterious figures believed to have descended from the heavens? Skeptics dismiss this as fantasy, but the visual parallels are hard to ignore. Across continents, across thousands of years, the same shape appears. Stretched skulls, high foreheads, elongated faces. Coincidence? 
Maybe, but maybe not. This discovery forces us to ask, are the borders and identities we value today just temporary lines on a map destined to be erased by the next great migration? If you enjoyed this journey into the past, hit the like button and subscribe for more.